Lord, we're so thankful for your grace. So thankful, Lord, that you have redeemed us. You have made us your own. You have brought us into the people of God. And you're not done with us. You are transforming. You are bringing renewal into our life, making us more and more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. Today, Lord, remind us of that image that we bear as unique creatures of God's creation. Speak to us, Spirit of God, that we might know more of you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn them on, you can use an old school Bible like mine. You can look up on the screen behind me here shortly. We're going to be uh, reading the text from Genesis chapter 2. And uh, bear with me, we're going to be reading verse 4 to the end of the chapter. Hear these words. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the ground and watered the whole surface. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon, it winds through the entire land of Havla, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue on our journey through the different foundations of faith, uh, last week we talked about creation and how God created all things out of nothing, and at the end of creation that God stopped. He rested. He looked at what his hands had made. He said it was good. It was very good. He enjoyed 
the creation around him and how we too are called to stop. To stop something so difficult for us to do. And this week we're talking about the creation of human beings. We talked about it last week in Genesis 1 that God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness uh, and created human beings from the ground, breathe into them, the text says, the breath of life and the man, the human, became a human living creature. The breath of life. And what separates humanity from the animal kingdom is this breath of life and this awareness of spirituality, of ethics, of morals, of, of an idea of how to think and make decisions that are not based on in instinct. In other words, we are, do not have to live as human beings, that, as slaves to our instincts, as the animals do. So human beings are also the only creatures in the creation and in all of the animal kingdom that God speaks to directly and responds when humanity speaks back. And right at the beginning we see that the breath of life is breathed into them and then God sees that though there are animals, though there are living creatures all throughout the creation, there is no other creature like the human. There is a solitary existence and so God says it's not good for the man to be alone. So God causes the man to fall asleep, takes the rib out of the man, that can also mean side, out of the man and fashions a woman and brings her to the man. And the man says, whoa, man. That's a groaner, I know. Thank you for those courtesy laughs. Appreciate that. No, but he recognizes this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This, this creature is likened unto me. It's interesting, too, that Jewish and Christian commentaries talk about the, the dividing out of the human beings. That there was one human, one solitary human creature. And the idea that is explained in these commentaries from scholars is that both male and female natures, characteristics, are present in the human. And God separates those out in creating, creating the woman and gave femininity, back me up on this ladies, to the sex that could handle it. There is no doubt women are stronger than men. Maybe not physically, but in terms of endurance. Because you know this as well as I do. If men were actually able to have babies, they would have one. And that would be the end of that. Divided out and gave the feminine characteristics to the woman, gave the male characteristics to the man, and then brought them together where they would spend the rest of their life working to be one. In fact, in rabbinic and uh, Christian commentaries, specifically rabbinic, there is the idea of the oneness as two opposing forces. It's the picture of the beams of a house pressing against each other and together holding each other up. It is the idea that when we oppose each other, when we uh, criticize one another, when we try to make the other person better, and I hope it's in that in that uh, train of thought, when we do that, we actually become better together. We become one. And it is this oneness, especially for us, that is so powerful. God saw there was no community with the man and created another being like him so that humanity might have community as God has community in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit a Trinitarian community aspect in humanity. God created human beings to be in relationship with one another and for males and females to be together to demonstrate the oneness of God. Beautiful concept. 
So ladies, you just keep going on ahead and opposing your husband because you're doing God's work. Moving together in oneness. Alan P. Ross, talking about the breath of God in human beings that gives them life and the capacity that they have because of that, says it this way, this breath from God made man a living spiritual being with a capacity for spiritual understanding, discerning right from wrong, and communing with God. You know, the text says in chapter 3, which we're getting to next week, that God would walk with humanity in the cool of the day. There was relationship, there was closeness, there was creator and creature enjoying one another. But there's also something interesting in this idea of image bearing. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There is an idea that of all creation, no other being quite is able to sum up what it means to carry the image of God like human beings. It's also interesting that there is a prohibition that Moses lays out in the Torah against any any images. It's uh, the first part of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven image of me either of birds or living creatures or human beings. God says that no image can be created that will rightly uh, display the glory and the power of God. There is nothing in the creation that can be hobbled together from stone or wood or from any other thing that can adequately describe the greatness of God. And the reason for that, the reason that there is no image is because humanity was intended to carry that image. Not in our physical appearance, but in our capacity to be spiritually aware, to live in freedom, and to bring about good in whatever we do. In that way, we are image bearers of God. We bring good, we bring the fulfillment of God's intent as we live into our image as human beings. In the ancient East, there were kings in power and what they would do because they could not be everywhere they would erect statues of themselves in the regions that they controlled as a sign to the people that were living in that region that the sovereign rule of this king extended into this area and his power was reminded by the statue that they saw even though it's not an exact image it's the closest metaphor that we can get to but how what God does in humanity all of us in this room reflect the image of God because we were created in God's image and likeness we have an incredible capacity to choose to bring about God's goodness on the earth but unfortunately we also have the capacity for quite the opposite which we'll talk about next week or I guess, so, I suppose in two weeks. It's an incredible privilege to be image bearers. Walter Brueggemann in his commentary on Genesis 2 says, the image of God in the human person is a mandate for power and responsibility. But it is power exercised as God exercises power. The image images the creative use of power which invites evokes and permits. There is nothing here of coercive or tyrannical power, either for God or for humankind. What is he talking about? He's talking about humanity's purpose. We were created in the image and likeness of God, and God's instruction to humanity is to be fruitful and multiply, which I think we've done a pretty good job of. But it's also to have dominion. 
Now, whenever I say that word, I know that in, in your mind, there are pictures of tyrannical and authoritarian power. There are images of conquering and coercion, of taking by force uh, and conquering lands to bring into the hegemony of the empire, the ruler that is over whatever areas they can take or conquer. That's the picture of dominion. And when we talk about having dominion, it seems like it is very oppressive. But that's not what the text is saying at all. The kind of dominion that God gives to humanity, it, this power comes with, as Brueggemann says, responsibility. Power and responsibility. If you think about police officers, police officers are given power to be able to carry out their responsibilities, to be able to do the things they need to be able to do to enforce the law. We as parents are given power over our children, not to abuse or exploit them, but to exercise our responsibility to raise them to be productive members of society, bearing the image of God in all that they do. That's what the power dominion is given for. It's so that we can carry out our responsibility to bear the image of God, to be able to exercise dominion over the animal kingdom and over the earth is so that we might help the creation live into the fullness of what God created it to be. And likewise, our responsibility as human beings one to another is to help each other become the people that God has created us to be. Not create, help them to be the people we want them to be or a culture wants them to be or a fad or a people group, but to be the people that God intends for them to be, to recognize their worth and their value as human beings. And they too have been given dominion in order to bear the image throughout the world of the creator who has brought them forth to represent him in the world. We have lots of representing to do, brothers and sisters. The world needs to be reminded that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They need to be reminded that God has a plan that is good and right to bring about his goodness on the earth. And it's a plan to prosper it's a plan to help people fulfill their God-given responsibility and to do that and exercise that as image bearers. There's so many in our world who's, who bear the image of God, but that image has been distorted. It's been covered. It's been hidden as one might cover a painting or hide a work of art somewhere in an attic or storage building. But it's our responsibility to lift the cover off, to dust it off, to draw attention to it, that there is a goal that the painter had in mind. It was that this work of art would say something to the world in a way that no other piece can. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's the purpose of Humanity as image bearers. Bregman goes on to say this, the human creature attests the godness of God by exercising freedom with authority over all the other creatures entrusted to its care. So this topic is endless. We could spend hours. We don't have that kind of time. But I want to leave you with some things to whet your appetite that you might look further in the text, that you might tease and dig out all of the meaning that is there. The first thing that I want to talk about is image bearing. What does that mean? As we bear the image of God, it is important for you and I to see other human beings with the dignity and the grace that God has given them because they also bear the image of God. Well, pastor, what about our enemies? 
especially our enemies. Well, what about our political enemies? Okay, well, just never mind. No, them too. All people from every nation and tribe and every condition, male or female, it doesn't matter. All humanity has been created in the image of God and they therefore deserve our dignity and respect. Pastor, does that mean I have to agree with them? No, but you can not agree with people. This is the greatest truth, by the way, that our generations that are on the earth now needs to hear. You can absolutely disagree wholeheartedly with people and still love and respect them. You can do that. It is a lie to suggest otherwise. And when people begin to figure that out, this world will be a much better place. And maybe what God is calling all of us to do is in bearing the image of God, treat people with dignity and respect that we cannot see eye to eye with on a variety of issues. The second thing is dominion. God has given you dominion or power or authority, but he has also coupled that with responsibility. It's not just so that you can do whatever you want, that you can abuse that dominion or power, but so that you might use it to do the mission that God has given you to do in the world, to bear the image of God correctly and to invite others into bearing the image of God in their lives. Lastly, God's rule and reign on the earth. That was the purpose of humanity. To go forth in the earth, to to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue the earth, to have dominion over it, to spread out and to take the image of God over all of the creation. God has a will beyond the creature and requires the creature to live according to the Creator's will. Adam is limited. The creature cannot be the Creator. There's a will that God has for this earth, and it is part of our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ, as image bearers of the living God, to live into that responsibility, to announce the rule and reign of God. And how do we do that? We, we go and storm a building and take it over by force. We mob people, we protest and beat them and take over and monopolize. No. We speak ill of people. No. The way that we announce the rule and reign of God is instead of raising the fist, we bend the knee. Your life in surrender to God is louder than any bullhorn. It's better than any advertisement. It is a message of the power and the glory of God at work in humanity. And if you live your life in obedience to Christ, it will shout the glory of God. First in your families, then beyond it, It will shout it to your enemies who will be confused when you love them even though they can't stand you. That's what it means to announce the rule and the reign of God. And my prayer for us is that we would step into that, not grudgingly, but willingly to bring about the glory of God on the earth. May may it be so, and may God give us grace to do that in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Is he worthy? He is. Then go and bear his image in the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.